Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's um, Technology 101 webinar session. My name is Kyle Hodges, and I'm an Assistant Director for Business and Technology in the UVA Career Center. And if this is your first webinar, um, or if you've joined us before, we've been planning these this summer to kind of give students some exposure to different career paths. And um, they've been a lot of fun so far, so we're really happy that y'all are here. I also want to make sure that you all know that we are doing these for both um, finance and consulting this summer, too. So you can check those out in Handshake as well. Um, but today we're really excited to host Ben Miller, who graduated from UVA with bachelor's degrees in both English and computer science. Um, he is currently, let me see if I can get this title right, Ben. Um, he is currently a general manager for several LA-based immersive and traditional content companies. He's an intro to game design instructor and consultant for indie games and XR companies. Um, it's a mouthful, but it's exciting stuff. Um, so I'm going to ask Ben some questions about his role. But students, um, feel free to ask questions, Ben. Ask questions to Ben throughout the session as well in the Zoom chat. Um, he's excited to be here and answer your questions. So don't be shy about popping those into the chat and interacting with him. Um, so with that, let's just jump into the questions and get started. Great. Cool. So Ben, um, would you just introduce yourself and just start off by telling us a little bit about your time in undergrad at UVA? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, it's great to be here, everyone. I'm really excited to give back and, and share some of what I learned about, um, you know, the world of game design and um, the crazy world of working in entertainment uh, nowadays. Uh, so primarily, I'm a executive producer, general manager, game designer, and entrepreneur. I've worked across entertainment and video game and software industries. Um, I've got a pretty interdisciplinary career, and I just give a little bit of background so everybody has a little bit of context. Um, might give you some, uh, at least uh, some information on, on different questions to ask. Um, so I've held around 13 different positions. I've, I've worked on over 50 is crazy 50 different projects 18 of which are games and i built three organizations from the ground up i've worked as a triple a game developer an indie game developer i've worked at technology startups creative agencies and hollywood studios i've built uh triple a games mobile games uh, vr games ar experiences mobile apps social platforms activations 360 videos it goes on and on um and right now, as Kyle uh, mentioned, that uh, you know I'm, I'm a general manager of several small companies, and I'm an advisor uh, to various indie uh, game developers and immersive companies. And I love teaching game design in my spare time. My time at UVA uh, was really was really awesome. Part of what was really great is that I came in with a with some credits already kind of locked in, like AP classes, whatever. And I had a little bit of flexibility and UVA really gave me the opportunity to explore that. Like I was able to kind of craft a curriculum that at least at that time felt rather unique. Um, you know, I, I, after talking with different professors and doing some research, I found kind of a, a, a mix of classes and opportunities that really let me dive into both the, the arts, uh, specifically through English literature, creative writing, professional writing, uh, as well as technology, specifically through computer science um, and engineering. Um, and I felt really lucky to be at UVA at a time where we had an incredible uh, group. There's kind of like a triumvirate almost of computer graphics professors uh, and so I was able to take a lot of high level computer graphics classes that were like an incredible primer in the world of not just video games, but really any type of software. Um, in addition to that, there were some early classes that were getting started. You know, there was like one in the architecture um, department around using 3D modeling uh, software and 3D animation software, um, which was again, a really awesome experience in terms of getting my hands on professional grade software and getting an opportunity to learn that in the creation of, you know, these small short projects. Cool. That sounds so awesome. And like, yeah, just like the amount of things that you've worked on and the things that you've done since graduating, I'm excited to kind of like dig in and learn more about some of that. It sounds sure. so impressive when you say like, you know, 13 <laughs> different companies and 
50 different things um, yeah. in such a short time. So yeah, awesome. appreciate it. Yeah. So since upon your graduation from UVA, you've clearly done a lot since then. Yeah. Can you give us an idea about your career, tra career trajectory and I guess what you enjoy the most about what you do now as this general manager kind of independent consultant? Yeah. My career trajectory is, is very, is non-traditional in a lot of ways. I think the things that have really driven me, you know, from, from job to job and opportunity to opportunity are, are, are a couple of things. Number one, really passionate about learning new skills. I think this is something that's very much ingrained in me as a lifelong learner and somebody who constantly loves acquiring new skills and, and, and experiences. Um, it's also something that I feel is essential uh, for all game designers. You know, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, I think, but it's really important to, um, you know, cultivate that passion um, to learn new things and disciplines. And, and in my career, as I have moved from, you know, let's say AAA game developer and indie game developer into the world of startups and making these, you know, crazy virtual worlds, a lot of that came to came down to, oh, I can go learn a bunch of new skills now. This is going to be awesome. Let me take this opportunity and see where it leads me. Um, and the second thing that's kind of guided my trajectory is kind of searching for opportunities that allow me to create new forms of entertainment. I am somewhat obsessed with the, uh, the struggle in creating you know, new forms of, you know, whether that's interactive stories or completely immersive experiences, um, you know, going from company um, and, and position to position that really support that has been a motivating factor. You know, while I was at a, a startup called Weaver, um, we pivoted the comp company a couple of times and eventually we started working on early immersive technology. So early virtual reality experiences, early virtual reality games. And this was just a you know, mind blowing, amazing adventure uh, to be on. And it's something that I've just kind of kept doing as I continue to grow as a professional. Um, you know, being obsessed with kind of building the concept of meaningful play. You know, meaningful play being this um, experience that enriches your life and, and, and the world around us beyond simply something we do uh, for entertainment purposes alone is I think a big driving force. And the last thing that's really guided my career is pursuing interdisciplinary roles. So specifically jobs that require on any given day that I use different areas of expertise or different disciplines is something that I find myself really drawn to. It, it keeps me engaged, it keeps me excited, and it's something that I, I'm very well equipped to do, um, which is again, something that I think all great game designers have, is they have an ability to be very creative and then very technical and then, and then be thinking about how to communicate and, and lead uh, the rest of the team. Um, and so those, those three things have really guided my trajectory, I think. In terms of my day to now, is what I love most is, is really giving back, you know, um, guiding organizations, um, helping young professionals grow, uh, mentoring um, you know, students, uh, I love empowering people with tools and processes and, and giving them a perspective that, that helps them grow and achieve um, amazing things. You know, I've really spent the bulk of my career in creating content and being in the weeds um, or, or leading small to medium to large size teams. And now I'm embarking on this next phase, which is really in my mind all about kind of giving back and, um, leading as best I can at a high level. Yeah, oh, that is so cool to hear you say. And like, there's so many uh, good nuggets of wisdom in uh, that entire answer. The thing that sticks out to me, um, the first, well, one of the things that sticks out to me out of all that good stuff was the importance of curiosity and gaining skills. I think mm -hmm. um, students are in such a position right now to, uh, they have all this extra time on their hands if they're not yeah. taking classes um, or anything, especially this summer. 
but to gain skills. And uh, students, if you're not aware, you have access, free access to all Coursera courses right now, as well as LinkedIn Learning. There's literally no better opportunity to get curious and gain some skills right now. Um, so I'll yeah. put a plug in for that. And, uh, you know, you heard it from Ben, <laughs> like that's, this is the perfect time to be curious and gain skills. So that's really cool. And then also just the importance of not leaning on just one skill set alone. I really yeah. liked how you talked about combining the technical with the creative and, um, you know, the importance of still leading and those kind of like interpersonal skills are just as important even in roles that might be more technical. Absolutely. I think that honestly, soft skills, I mean, number one, uh, I think I'd encourage everybody to, you know, one of the things that has paid dividends in my life and continues to pay dividends is a dedication to, um, to lifelong learning and to, you know, to fighting for that and to working towards that. Um, and then the other thing which you touched on is around soft skills. And, and I think that honestly, when I'm looking at hiring people, soft skills in terms of uh, can they work well with teams? Are they a good communicator? Are, do they, you know, practice um, extreme accountability? You know, are they respectful? And can, are they a good listener? These are a hundred percent at the same level as, if not higher than your ability to execute a specific task. You know, a, 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 a good, um, let's just say game designer, right? Compared to a genius game designer, where the good game designer is someone who's gonna be great to work with and the genius is gonna be terrible to work with, will always hire the good game designer. Yeah. Always. You can teach the tech skills. You can't always teach the soft skills. <laughs> That's right. Cool. This is one of my favorite questions. Um, and I ask it because um, we have students of all class years and experience levels in this webinar. Um, so can you define game design in the most basic terms? How did you learn that this was a field to go into and know that you wanted to pursue it? Right, so great question, right? Defining game design is, is actually quite a challenging thing to do. I think at its most fundamental level, it's the, the, the craft of deciding what a game should be mm -hmm. or a part of a game should be and building it for others to play, mm -hmm. right? And, and I know that sounds really general, but it's, it's general on purpose because game design is not, I'm assuming that most people coming into this class are thinking about game design as video game design, like those are equivalent. Game design is much larger than that. It extends far beyond the world of video games. Um, and the craft of game design is something that has been honed and, and popularized relatively recently, but I think that it's worth considering the historic perspective here. You know, the oldest game that we know of this game called Senate, we think, right? It was played over 5,000 years ago. I mean, that is, as far as I can understand, you know, a couple hundred years, maybe a thousand years, uh, after what we understand is the advent of, of writing, yeah. right? You know, what's incredible that, about that fact is that it tells you a couple of things about games and about game design that I find amazingly humbling and inspiring. And number one is games are necessarily global. They span all cultures, they span all races, they span all socioeconomic lines. They are truly something that binds the world together. They're also in our DNA. They're part of who we are as humans, right? Play is something you can see in, in all types of creatures, right? And humans have honed that into something that we call games. And the third thing that I find that this historical perspective teaches us is that games are beyond legitimate and culturally meaningful, right? When I got started, my parents were, I think, you know, meaningfully concerned about you're spending your time playing games. You know, I've been a lifelong fan of video games. Like, what are you gonna do with this? Ah, right? And eventually you can make a career out of it. Yeah. Um, but even if you don't, it is a very meaningful activity, you know? And I think that all of this is very empowering because when you consider the historic perspective and you consider the greater understanding of video games as a craft and as a, sorry, games as a craft and a medium, 
you realize that anyone can be a game designer at any time. And, and honestly, I think it's the most exciting time to be a game designer. You're seeing a greater diversity of games than we've ever had before. You're seeing a greater amount of access to games than you've ever seen before. You're seeing more um, types of people around the world playing games more frequently every day. And all of that says to me is that there's more opportunity for this as a profession, but there's also more opportunity for more joy in the world, right? Like playing games and making games is an act of bringing joy or, or engagement um, to the world. And I think with everything happening right now, I mean, that would be a nice thing to have <laughs> more people making and playing games. I, okay. I, I think play makes the world a better place. And I think it's something we need now more than ever. So, um, you know, that's kind of like the high level, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you think about game design, I encourage you not to think just about video games because mm -hmm. when you think about it, just it, when you only categorize it as video games, it becomes a harder, more unattainable goal. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that all you need to be a game designer is uh, a deck of cards, a paper, a pencil. You can even do it with sticks and rocks, right? And uh, sit down, prototype a game, and play it with someone, and you are a game designer, right? Um, and I think that's amazing, and I encourage everyone to go do it, right? Number one thing, if you're excited about game design right now, is to start making games. Um, There's so many different ways that you can make games, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, on a very practical level, right, as a video game designer, you're designing, building, and tuning the player experience of a game. That's a, that's a very broad term, um, but it's accurate because games are complex and they're multi-layered, and there's a lot that goes into defining the player experience. So as a game designer, yeah, you're making puzzles, you're building levels, you're designing abilities, you're creating goals, you're... Um, uh, designing characters, you know, and, and you're implementing these things, you're testing them with other people, uh, you're listening to your, their feedback, and then you're going back through the iterative process of designing, you know, any of what we just listed. Yeah, it seems like such a long process when you kind of like, when you actually sit down and think about it. And admittedly, I have not thought about the entire process of game design and not definitely not about the perspective that you just shared. And so that's awesome, but it's, I can imagine it's hard creative work. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that's really it's, cool. it's difficult partially because you're building something for other people. Mm -hmm. So it requires actually quite a bit of empathy. It requires great listening. That's actually one of game designers most important skills, if not the most important skill is listening to uh, your players, listening to yourself, listening to the game, listening to your teammates. Um, it requires a lot of listening and the, and the, and the craft is iterative. Mm -hmm. So you're doing it over and over and over and over again. You know, you start with an idea, you build a little prototype, you go test that, right? You analyze that feedback and then you go and rebuild the prototype and you just continue to iterate and iterate and iterate. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I guess on a personal level, when did you find out that this was a thing that you could do for a career? Like were you in college, in high school? Kind of what did that look like for you? No, it's a good question. I think when I was, so I've been, I've loved video games since I was like five, you know, and even though I think uh, maybe my first video game was something in the arcade or maybe it was the Atari. Um, and, and throughout high school, middle school, high school, you know, uh, I played a lot of games. I started to kind of get involved in um, modding games and making levels and while I was building websites and stuff. And I started kind of thinking about this uh, and I couldn't really find a lot of information on becoming a game designer, right? It was this nebulous thing. So it was always something that was in the back of my mind, but it wasn't something I felt comfortable pursuing outright. Um, and so really it became a achievable goal towards the end of college where I started to really look at 
different professions and different opportunities and and then you know start the the, the brutal brutal application process of going through that and nowadays i think it's it's quite different which is great yeah. um i think there's a lot more clearer paths out there i think there's a lot more competition but i think that there's you know even more ways to learn and and um you know build a case for yourself build a portfolio and and make a good play at breaking in yeah, absolutely that's awesome um i guess along with that um this question uh, what types of tech skills or programs are crucial in the work of a um i guess the video game designer to be specific mm -hmm. um I guess kind of really on a practical granular level, what are kind of some of those programs that you have used and that you've seen people rely on? Right. So I think that, I think that in terms of just like tool, like software tool sets, you know, you've got um, some type of, whether it's, you know, it's a document spreadsheet, you know, Microsoft suite, Google suite, whatever it is, those are used daily, you know, whether you're um, doing game design documents or whether you're building, um, you know, spreadsheets to help tune variables. Um, in addition to that, you have your kind of game engines, right? So there's a number of, you have Unity and Unreal and, and a, a number of others that are um, kind of widely available. Uh, and depending upon the company you end up working for, they could be using their own proprietary engine. You know, when I worked at Insomniac Games, uh, they had their own proprietary engine. So it's an in-house game engine that they build and support uh, themselves. So, you know, when you get hired somewhere, you've got to kind of learn those tools. So I think that at a base level, you know, you want to be comfortable with that, you know, those tool sets. And again, there's, there's plenty of ways to kind of go out today and just get acclimated and get that experience. I think I'd encourage everyone else to even go further. Um, in my career, one of the most valuable resources, uh, skills, kind of you know, programs that that I learned uh, that have that have really helped accelerate uh, my career and it made me a stronger game designer is getting into uh, computer science, programming, engineering. So understanding IDEs and understanding um, you know different types of coding environments uh, is something that uh, while you're not usually and you know coding heavily as a game designer you will often be scripting and scripting can take place in something that looks like a you know, notepad or, or a readme document or it can take uh, place in something like a Microsoft Visual Studio so that I think is really um, valuable to spend time learning I mean, honestly, I think everybody going to school now should take a computer science course. I think the, the, the value in understanding how software works uh, is much larger than just the world of video games. I think uh, when I look into the future, I see everything going interactive to some degree. And a lot of UI, UX design, app design, software development, you know, some of the best practices have come out of game design or at least been influenced uh, from that. So I think that it's, it's a really valuable way to make yourself, you know, an incredibly uh, valuable candidate to a lot of different organizations down the road. The last thing that I'll say is an, a basic understanding of 3D um, software suites, 3D art creative software suites. So, um, you know, Maya, uh, Autodesk, Blender, um, in addition to, you know, basic Adobe Photoshop. Uh, is, is hugely valuable. Not only because depending on where you're working, you might dive into those tool sets because you need to make a couple changes to a model or you need to input a texture or you need to make some changes to some type of graphics real quick. Um, but it also enables you to communicate with the artists and the engineers on your team a lot more effectively. And that is something that you know has just paid off dividends for me in my career. That's awesome. And I think I'm just like with this, I'm envisioning like students resumes and that like technical skills section of, you know, here are the creative skills, here are the coding languages, here are just kind of like the design features that these experience that I feel like I'm envisioning a mile long. <laughs> <laughs>
but that's really helpful to have kind of like that handful um, that is going to be really essential for students. And I'm sure they're ones that y'all look for when you're kind of making those hires too. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you, I think that it's, when you're coming into the world of game design, you've got to have a portfolio of some kind, unless you're, unless you're breaking into the industry through QA or you're coming in as an engineer and then want to transition to be a game designer. I think that, you know, it's assumed that you have a portfolio. Um, and by making that portfolio, you're part of what you're doing is you're showing your mastery of, if not the tool set you will use in your day to day, a similar or comparable tool set of what you need to use in your day to day. So I think that that's absolutely a must um, in today's landscape. Yeah, that's a really helpful move. Um, and so speaking of breaking into the industry, um, mm -hmm. you received your master's in entertainment technology. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess what led you to that decision? And are there careers in game design that students could pursue with just their bachelor's degree in, like you said, like engineering or computer science, things like that? Yeah, I, I went, uh, so I got my master's, yeah, at Carnegie Mellon Entertainment Technology, and I, I loved it. It was an amazing program. Absolutely do not need a master's degree to break into the industry. I think my master's degree helped me uh, break in. It was helpful to have that. It also helped me um, kind of in terms of leading teams and um, accelerating my career to, to a certain degree. Um, but it is absolutely not a requirement. I think that honestly, with the right portfolio, with the right you know, relationships and just doing the work and doing everything you can to grow your network, uh, you'll be able to to break in. I mean, honestly, you need a, as I mentioned before, a portfolio of some amount of levels or some games that you've made, board games, video games, mobile games. I mean, a, a combination of these is even more preferable. Um, and uh, most jobs, at least in my career, right, have come from relationships. So I think that as if you want to pursue a, a career in game design, working on your portfolio is maybe a little bit more important, but not too much more important than building your network um, and uh, banding together with similar people that are uh, trying to break in, uh, that are veterans, uh, et cetera. Yeah, and thank you for saying that. That is something that I probably say in every single student meeting of just the importance of building your network. Yeah. And so it's always helpful to have somebody who is clearly successful say that as well. Um, because it'll say it till we're blue in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I wish I spent more time on earlier, honestly. I think yeah. it's something I've really, really embraced later on in my career and have made it um, you know, built it into my day-to-day -day processes, which is, you know, managing who I'm in touch with, what our relationship is with each other. Do I want to grow that? You know, when was the last time we were in touch? Things like that. Taking a scientific attitude towards it or approach has really been helpful to me. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're so appreciative of like friendly alumni like you and students. Like I just reached out to Ben on a whim because I saw that he had an experience that I wanted to learn more about for you all. And so this is just a note. This is exactly what these conversations look yeah. like if you were just on the phone. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I'll say it over and over again, but just kind of like take the chance, send the message. Um, you never know what's on the other side. So don't be afraid to reach out to our really, really awesome alum. Um, and I guess on the opposite end of your master's degree, again, I'm just so curious about the combination of English and computer science. Like, yeah. And I think that's amazing that you have landed in the roles that you have with mm. kind of that English degree especially and so mm. I'd love to hear more about kind of that liberal arts background for you and mm -hmm. how you think that has implemented your work and possibly you know going back to those soft skills that you might have gained through that experience. Yeah I it's a great question I think that I think that for me one of the ways that the liberal arts background helped Help me grow as a as a game designer and future lead, future leader is around specifically around communication. 
uh, communicating with different people, um, analyzing words, statements, you know, thinking about uh, different layers of meaning um, in, yes, in books, but just in, in how we speak. You know, one of the most, there's a couple liberal arts classes I took that I feel had a very transformative experience for me. One was a, um, it was something like an academic and professional writing class, which initially I didn't really know what I was going to get out of it, but ultimately what it was was a, um, a very practical, uh, almost like mm, accelerated crash course in like in grammar and how to speak and how to write properly so people understand uh, what you're saying. So that combined with a couple of classes I took on rhetoric, which is the art of speaking um, and quote unquote getting what you want out of the audience that you're talking to. Those were really transformative in terms of approaching I mean, highlighting the importance of language and highlighting some skills in terms of how to best craft messages that will land with your audience. I think, you know, one of the things I, I took out of that is a honest assessment of how long it can take to craft an effective message, but how valuable that time is usually spent, like how valuable that time spent is, right? And so today in my day to day, uh, you know, I'm working at on, on you know, partnerships and these larger, you know, potential agreements between different organizations. And, and sometimes, you know, I'll spend hours working on an email. And it seems like, wow, you're spending hours working on an email. The end result is that you end up getting the response you want. And that can be, you know, much more valuable um, in the long term, and so it's worthwhile to spend that time, you know. So I think I think that's one of the things that that it definitely gave me. On the other side, I think teamwork and bonding with different people uh, is crucially important. And this came out of actually a lot of, you know, liberal arts. Really, the the, the nexus for me with liberal arts and computer science was that during my time, and I'm, I'm sure it's different now, but during my time at UVA taking all these computer science classes, it was literally myself and a good friend of mine now, Kim, uh, we were the only liberal arts people wow. in the, these computer science classes, right? And, and a lot of them were, you know, project-based. And um, so we'd be teaming up together and we'd be teaming up with other uh, engineers and computer scientists. And I think learning how to work with people from different disciplines uh, was a hugely valuable uh, soft skill uh, that has, you know, again, been, been a massive help to me in my career. That's awesome. And I know you're not the only college grad and I'm not the only college grad who can look back and say like those liberal arts courses that we were not super excited to take, but like we had to take for our general education requirements have been some of the most influential. Um, yeah, for sure. For so sure. I, go ahead. No, I was just a practical writing class. It was just, uh, it was wild. It was, I never anticipated how important it would be. Um, but it's something I think about, I mean, all the time. It's wild. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, because I know, I remember I took a medical ethics class and I'm like, well, okay, here we are now. <laughs> so <laughs> right, it's right. always those classes you don't expect that end up being the most um, relevant. Um, so students, as a reminder, feel free to ask them questions throughout this session. Um, anything that's on your mind, it doesn't have to be related to things we're talking about, but anything that's on your mind about game mm -hmm. design or um, any advice, feel free to toss them in the chat. We'll get to them throughout the rest of the conversation or um, at the end. So don't be shy. Um, yeah, love, love, to, love to have some questions. Cool. Love to have some questions. <laughs> Um, so I guess now kind of getting a little bit more to the nitty gritty, uh, tell me what your day to day looks like. Right. So the day to day, again, it's a great question. I mean, the day to day a game designer is not super easy to define. Again, it's, it's part of the reason is partly due to the complexity of games and how, you know, fluid the process is of, of creating great games. Um, but generally speaking, your day-to-day -day is going to be defined by, you know, where you are in the phase of development of that video game um, and your next kind of deliverable, right? So 
And it also depends, you know, it also depends on the size of the company you're working on. So we'll, I'll kind of walk us through a couple of examples and we can kind of go from there. So typically, let's say you're working at a AAA game uh, developer. Let's say you're in the middle of production, all right? Um, you've been assigned uh, a level to design. And let's say you've been assigned an enemy uh, to tune as well, right? So you'll, you'll come in and uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, the entire company is uh, submitting their um, content and updates to a, you know, some type of um, uh, Perforce or some type of, you know, code revision uh, software, and they'll build the game overnight, right? Sometimes builds can take hours, sometimes depending on the company, it can take minutes, but usually it takes a long time. So you'll get in and you'll play the latest build. You'll write up the notes, you'll say, okay, this is working, this isn't working, whatever. Um, then you'll sit down, you'll start implementing those. Later on in the afternoon, you'll have a general kind of creative brainstorm led by the game director around some aspect of the game. Let's say it's around multiplayer, let's say it's around, you could have it be around the size of the doors in the level. So now, um, or how high the character jumps, right? So you'll get back to your desk, you know, you'll be chatting with different people on Slack about things. Uh, you'll walk over to an engineer's desk, check on uh, a feature that's being implemented that's a core part of the level that you're building, um, and then kind of round out the day, potentially doing a company-wide uh, playtest of the multiplayer version of the game that you're building, right? Contrast that to, let's say you're working at the same AAA game developer, uh, but your game is now, um, you know, you've passed beta and you're moving into gold. Okay, so the game is essentially complete um, and you are trying to polish it as much as possible. So your day to day is likely coming in, looking at the bug reports, seeing all of the bugs that are assigned to you, jumping into individual levels, fixing different types of bugs. So maybe um, uh, an enemy in a specific level, let's say an enemy in an environmental object, don't have the right. Um, shadows, you know, shadows aren't enabled on them and they need to be enabled. So you'll go into those levels, you'll click on, you'll find the things that they're not enabled, you'll enable them, you'll test it out, you'll submit it, you'll go on to the next bug. And that could be your entire day, right? Contrast that to let's say you're working at a very small indie developer. You're a game designer. You're working in pre-production now. So you haven't gone into production. You're essentially building um, a prototype, hopefully a polished prototype. Uh, that you can show to someone maybe to get funding, maybe to lock in a publisher deal. Uh, so you're there working with the rest of the team and your responsibility is, you know, you're actually involved with a story implementation across the entire game, okay? So part of your day-to-day -day is you're writing or you're doing some type of editing around uh, the actual uh, you know, the story that's been given to you by a writer. You're implementing that into the game. You're making sure that the story is triggered at the right time when the player is uh, going through the level. You're making sure that the right sound effects are being played. You're making sure that the lighting looks right um, in those different story scenes. You know, you're responsible for all of that. So you would spend your day jumping between all these different levels, talking to different disciplines to make sure that they have things submitted and um, essentially assuring that the, the story beats are uh, implemented uh, as best as possible. Um, along the way, you'll probably write down some uh, tasks that uh, you would like to have accomplished to make the player experience even better. That would go over to a project manager uh, or producer who would then review them, prioritize them, um, and work with the team to estimate how long those tasks are going to take. Wow. Which is very different from working on a live game. <laughs> so let's say you work at, you know, Riot or you're, you know, you're working on League of Legends or you're working at uh, Blizzard on Overwatch or you're working at Epic on Fortnite or something like that. Or you're working at Bungie on Destiny 2. You know, your day-to-day -day would be different if you're designing the next batch of uh, weapons and quests coming out um, versus if, let's just say, you just launched the last update so you're checking to see how the players are responding, if they're running into any issues, you know, you're starting to generate a list of uh, to-dos for a patch or um, transitioning onto the next major update. So it's, 
it's quite varied. The day-to-day in a life of a game designer is is very different uh, depending upon where you are in the game, what company you're at, what type of game you're building. That's part of what I love about it is that it's always something new. Yeah, wow, that just blows my mind because like I think about what I know like about video games and the pro like like I said before like I think I'm a detail oriented person but like that just it's so many details to take into consideration and that's yeah. really amazing to me. Yeah. Um, but it looks like soon, so you popped some questions into the chat, and I want to make sure that we prioritize these, Ben. Um, so uh, let's look at the first one. You mentioned how everyday UX design takes lessons from games. Could you give an example of that? That's a good, I mean, that's a good question. I, I'm sorry, I maybe misspoke before. I don't mean to say that everyday UX takes lessons from gaming. What I am pointing to is that in the world of gaming, feedback loops are incredibly valuable in terms of keeping players engaged and educating players on what to do or what not to do, right? And UX principles in terms of designing user uh, interfaces that are engaging, um, fun to use, and educate their um, the audience on how to interact with them, they, they share a lot of, there's some shared knowledge there. Right. And with what I see as, you know, from a software point of view, um, when you look at it writ large in terms of how we engage as humans with technology, um, everything is becoming more interactive. Right. right? Um, and it's and, and the importance of creating enjoyable experiences just from clicking a button right, on your iPhone or whatever, um, I think that there's a lot of commonalities um, in the world of, that can be seen in the world of, of, of game design. So I think that the point that I'm trying to make is that I feel the core of game implementation shares quite a bit with um, UX, UI design in terms of uh, creating systems that other people use um, that respond and educate them without telling them outright what to do. You know, like as a game designer, you want people to, let's say you're a level designer, you want people to go through that level in a specific way. As a player, you don't want to be told how to explore a level. You want to feel the agency that you're exploring it on your own right? And then you're coming up with the decisions. That's really the challenge of being a game designer is that you want to ensure that people are having the right player experience, which is ensuring that they're hitting the right beats at the right time, essentially guiding them through the level without telling it. And as a player, you just don't want to feel that. So I feel like that's kind of like a, it's like a, it's like a double or more extreme version of great UX design. You know, great UX design is you want this button to feel great. You want to make sure people know how to click this button. You want to make sure that people know how to uh, navigate this interface. Right. And it is very challenging. Um, but I think there's a shared space there. So yeah, really cool. That's it. Very cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so then this one, uh, back to the kind of that skill conversation, in the short term, would you recommend focusing on learning one skill very well or having a diverse set of them? Example, being very good at software versus comfortable with software modeling, design, et cetera. It's a great question. Uh, I think that in my personal experience, and this is, I think this is part of how I'm wired as a person, is that having a diverse set of skills has led to the you know, this kind of unique career that I've made for myself and an ability to experience a lot of different things, which I find incredibly valuable. As a game designer, that is part of what makes that, that's, that breadth of knowledge is what helps create a great game designer, in my opinion. The world of game design there are special specialties, right? You can be a great systems designer, right? You can be a great level designer. You can be a great multiplayer designer, 
right? And, and those have their own kind of funnels that you end up going down um, and becoming truly like sharp and, and a master at that. Um, so I would ask yourself, what do you feel comfortable with? What are you passionate about? You know, I'm passionate about and comfortable with knowing, knowing the full spectrum. I want to see the full picture. I want to understand everything going on so I can thread the needle on making, you know, difficult decisions um, that impact everybody in a company or everything in a product, right? If you're excited about that, that's awesome. Then I would pursue that. Go broad. I think that as everything becomes, this is my opinion, more interactive, um, I think there will be a greater need for broad skill sets. Uh, because you need to have a little bit of an understanding of engineering to be the best product owner or product manager on a software team or on a video game team or whatever, right? Um, but if you're really, really passionate and really good and, and love engineering, then by all means, double down on it. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it's up to you. Although, if you're entering the workforce in the next, whatever, five years, I, I do think a broad skill set is going to be more and more um, requested. That's my opinion. For sure. That's really helpful advice. So appreciate that. Um, and this is kind of in a similar vein. Um, the student finished their PhD in physics, actually. So has a okay. lot of programming experience, not much specific to game development. How would you suggest that the student breaks into the industry with so many jobs requiring so much game design experience? Will physics background help at all with job opportunities? And I'll say similarly, like I had a question in my list over here of, um, you know, how would a student even get started here? So that kind of is in the same vein. So I'd love for you to share your thoughts on that one. Yeah, so specifically about uh, PhD in physics mm -hmm. uh, and programming experience, I think that's great. You can, that alone, assuming you have got solid kind of object oriented programming experience like um you understand some level of real-time rendering um those two combinations makes you really valuable engineers are always needed especially engineers who have a incredibly strong math background which is actually something that's surprisingly rare um and physics are a huge driver from a technology point of view in modern video games. Like the physics engines you're seeing uh, nowadays are just mind blowing and incredible. And it's just gonna get better. There's gonna be more interest and need for it. Um, so I think that you're off to a really great start. I do think it's important as an engineer coming in to have some understanding of how game engines are built and maintained. Um, because it, there's different engineering disciplines within games. You can be a gameplay engineer, which generally means that you're building game features, right? You're going in there, okay, we need this, um, we need the UI to explode when uh, players touch it. Okay, let me go kind of go into the UI code and let me build in an explosion system and it's going to do all these different things, right? Gameplay engineers are kind of going in there and, and building these features. Then you've got your kind of um, systems engineers um, and more low level engineers that are working on the engine level. Uh, and so you're touching things like AI and you're touching things like physics systems and maybe you're building tools, you could be a tools engineer as well for the developers to make. So I think taking your physics uh, uh, background and engineering skills doing a little bit of investigation into game design or sorry game engines uh building some prototypes on stuff you can do you'll be great in terms of the gr the, the bigger question um of what you can do to gain skills in game design um honestly it's just number one start start designing building and playtesting your games there's no reason if you're interested in this there's no reason not to be making games right now um, start with board games, start on paper, right? Start with card games. If you own board games, cannibalize all those pieces. You know, I've got a bunch of board games I've just ripped apart to use to make my own board games, yeah. right? 
Um, those board games can then become video games. But what's great about the board game process is that it, it, it's foundational and you move at the speed of your brain, not at the speed of, the tech, of your understanding of the technology that you're using. So since iteration is such a core part of game design, uh, there's a lot of value there, especially when you're getting going. Um, but the other things is, you know, get Unity, get Unreal, go through the tutorials. The intro tutorials are great. Um, recruit other people. Uh, doing this on your own is hard. Uh, so get involved in game jams. Um, get involved in communities, online communities or local communities of uh, indie developers or enthusiasts. Um, recruit other people to your cause. Um, but more than anything, start making stuff and start making simple things. Um, don't, the great big game in your head, don't start there. Make a fraction of it. That's really helpful. Um, and I'm hoping you can help me interpret this next question. Um, it says there's been a lot of coverage about developer crunch in the past few years from many different yes. studios and companies. What's yes. your experience with crunch and do you see it changing? I don't know what that means, so would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so what we mean by crunch is essentially uh, people working, you know, 60 hours or more a week um, for extended periods of time. Typically in the game industry, and this is not, this is not everywhere, by the way, but at many game developers, uh, once you get, when you approach big milestones, so this could be going gold, this could be a vertical slice, this could be beta, whatever, they'll go into periods of crunch where you'll crunch for a couple of weeks, you crunch for a couple of months, and in worst case scenarios, you end up crunching um, for years, potentially. Um, what's my opinion on crunch? I, I think crunch is unhealthy. I think I, I have, my hope is that this changes at a industry level. Um, this is tied in with the question of unions. This is tied in with a lot of, I think, challenges that the industry writ large is facing now. I hope to see change. I see change happening. Um, it's happening slowly. I think that if you're concerned about crunch, the first thing you should do as you are moving into the industry is to talk to other people, to do some research, talk to other people at those game companies and have a frank conversation with them. Have a frank conversation around crunch. Say, what's it like? Everyone I've ever spoke to has been very open about this. You know, this is something that the game industry professionals share, you know, generally speaking. That being said, you know, I've got a friend who works at Bungie. They don't crunch at all. I mean, that to me is surprising that I, I hear no crunch. Um, but it's great. That's amazing to hear. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. I had no idea. So I appreciate you kind of like shedding some light on that and sharing your um, experience and opinion on it. Um, we've got like five minutes left. This has just flown by. And so we've got several other questions in here, Ben. So I'm going to have you actually take a look and see what you feel like is most you know, pertinent to answer. Um, yeah. You have more experience than I do in this, so whatever you uh, do. Like, all right, let's helpful. see if we can do rapid fire here. Uh, average starting salary of a game developer? That's a good question. Uh, I, I, there's a couple of websites online um, where you can find that. Master's or PhD, PhD degree is beneficial sometimes. It depends on exactly what you're going for and how it can be applied. Um, so yeah, it's, it depends. Uh, took any HCI interaction classes. I didn't have an opportunity to take HCI. I, I feel like when I was at UVA, there was maybe one class offered and I was really focused on the computer graphics side of things. Um, design thinking like concepts that you enjoyed. Another great question. I think, you know, I ended up leaning towards these 400 level classes that had independent projects that required a lot of design thinking. So for intro to computer graphics, you know, final project, we had to create our own, you know, small game, right? Mm -hmm. And then I had another 400 level computer science class where we had to 
make our own game throughout the entire semester, you know, coded from the ground up, right? Um, and so I think that looking at any classes, and I did a couple of um, independent studies that ended up becoming thesis long papers. So looking for those classes that has those projects are a good path to, to, to getting into the design thinking um, side of things. Uh, last question, if starting into a studio is valid option, horrible tales, yes. So self-taught, self-taught, vague made a connection. Can you start an indie studio by yourself? Uh, you can. It is very difficult. Uh, not impossible. Um, as long as you have the cash flow side of things worked out, are comfortable, you know, living very meagerly, you can definitely do it. Highly encourage you to check out um, Gama Sutra has a bunch of uh, kind of postmortems from indie developers on. Um, you know, what their experience was like building their own studio and launching their own game. What you will find is building the game is only half of the battle. You need to, to run a great indie studio. You need to be great at marketing. You need to be great at, uh, you know, you have an understanding of, of uh, your audience and what is selling. So um, running an indie studio is challenging. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I love it. I love all that type of stuff. That's a webinar unto itself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow, I appreciate you going kind of rapid fire through those. Um, oh, we got favorite game in there now. Favorite game. Oh, great question. Uh, I love that question. Much better than best game. I don't think best game applies. So, because uh, who can say best of anything? Favorite game is actually Miss Pac-Man Arcade Edition. And the reason oh. why is this. It hits these sweet spots for me. Number one, it's a, it's a game that holds up to this day. It plays beautifully. It's incredibly amazing. It's great. Number two, it's got a strong female protagonist, one of the first early examples of storytelling taken somewhat seriously in games. And number three, it was actually built by um, you know, former MIT students that were hacking ROMs that essentially to like make uh, arcade games uh, more challenging uh, back in the arcade days. And they were doing all this all illegally, and they ended up um, making a deal with Namco to release one of their hacked ROMs as Miss Pac-Man, which, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong, is the first example of modding in the world of games. So it's just all of these three back to back, and I'm like, Mwah, it's the that perfect game awesome. for me. That is awesome. And somebody said that's actually a pretty good reason. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Um, and the last rapid fire question, this has been my favorite one for each webinar. And so I'd yes. love for you to just kind of like get this one in here, the last round, any resources, websites, blogs, newsletters, conferences, et cetera, that you would suggest students look into, um, if they're yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that, uh, number one, go to the GDC vault. So game developers conference is the conference for game developers. It's an incredible experience. It was hugely important to me in crafting a career in the game industry. You can, you can attend it as a CA, a conference associate, which essentially means that they pay for your ticket because it's super expensive. And you, you're like the people that help guide the attendees into the uh, conference rooms and, you know, tallying the amount of people in each room. Totally worth it. Um, Gama Sutra, thank you. Someone put it into the chat. I think Twitter's a great resource. Uh, there's a bunch of game devs sharing their own tips um, and tricks on it. Check out itch.io, I-T-C-H dot I-O. It's a great indie uh, game platform slash community. They do game jams all the time. There's a lot of different like-minded people that you can meet there. Um, and then there's a, you know, there's a bunch of other kind of YouTube channels that we can't get into right now yeah. but um but yeah definitely go there awesome to start. super super helpful i was like writing them all down um ben are you okay with students connecting with you on linkedin if they have more yeah. follow-up questions of course absolutely consider me a resource i think i say this to everybody is that um as we mentioned before relationships are the most important thing and just understand that everybody that you reach out to, whether it's me or anyone else, right? They're busy people. And just because they don't respond doesn't mean 
that they aren't going to or that they haven't read it. They're probably just busy. So I know myself, when I started out in the career, I would beat up on myself constantly for not hearing back from someone. I would feel like a failure. That's not the case, right? People love giving back. I love giving back. I know a lot of other people do as well. So um, please feel free to reach out. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, I, thank you everyone for being here. This is an absolute pleasure. Um, I wish and you all the best of luck. Thank you so much. This was of course. great. Um, of course. We really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, students connect with him if you have more follow-up questions and some golden advice there that people are just busy, but they will get back to you. Um, yeah. So thank you again, Ben and students. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Absolutely. For Bye. Bye.